Hi, Aaron. Hey, Michelle. How are you? Okay. <laughs> My whole family has breakthrough COVID, but aside from that, you know. <laughs> oh, no. I know. I hope everyone's okay. Is everyone feeling okay? Yeah, everybody was vac- vaccinated and boosted where possible. So it, it's, you know, much more mild than it would have been otherwise. But... Mm. Okay. You too? Oh, yeah. I, I got the sickest of everyone. So if my voice is a little oh, no. deeper than usual, <laughs> if I seem a little foggy, I apologize. Wow. Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. It's. I guess everyone has to get it over with. I guess at so. At this point. Hopefully just once. I think we can get it again. Yeah. Do you want to test your slides? Uh, Your mute is on. And um, how's that? Looks good. Yeah, looks good. Should I stop sharing? Uh, sure. Yeah, I just have. Oh, uh, you'll be the first speaker, and I just introduce like the next week's talks first. Sounds good. So you took a self test, or you took the caller test? Yeah, no. So we we um we we flew back east to visit my in laws, and uh, somebody on the plane. Well, many people on the plane are sick, but somebody sitting behind us was obviously sick and taking off her mask to cough and sneeze, which was unbelievable. So we were strapped in for six hours in that situation. Oh, no. So I was very, I thought it was a very high risk exposure. So we were testing, um, and then on New Year's, I became febrile to one hundred two and <laughs> tested positive at oh, home. God everybody else did too. So it's not a mystery what happened. So I am doing a sabbatical in China. It's so different here. So Mm -hmm. like here, if you get a COVID test, you know, you assume it's negative because if it's positive, the police come and drag you out. uh, Oh, wow. (laughs) So so, um, yeah, so it's really, it's really, really, uh, we were, at a city in Southern China and the nearby city had one case in a city of 400,000 people and they locked the whole city down. Wow. Two weeks. So wow. It's, it's a little bit of a different approach. Yeah, for sure. But but there's no, hardly any cases. Although yeah. there's Omicron is just starting to spread around yeah. here. Yeah. I Right now, Omicron is literally everywhere. I, I Almost everyone I know yeah. is either affected or... Uh, know somebody who's affected the hospital's really in trouble all the physicians are getting it so kind of in yeah, a little I keep seeing these emails there. about the yeah yep it's not good and is it true it's less um less it's more upper respiratory um sorry hang on one So I, I think, you know, it's hard to know if it's Omicron or if it's, you know, COVID in vaccinated people, but it does seem to be more upper respiratory. Um, it certainly was for us. My sister is an ICU nurse in LA and she says in the COVID ward, that everyone in the ICU is unvaccinated. Yeah. That seems to be the trend. Vaccination is, is wonderful. Super great, grateful that we were vaccinated. Regretting getting on a plane though. Yeah, I yeah, I would I would stay away. And then anyone in your lab get it? Mm-hmm. Lots in separate oh. exposures. There hasn't been not from me. I I, I sort of isolated right away because I knew I was exposed, but. Um, People who flew over the holidays, several people um, tested positive when they got back. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. Hi. 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 <laughs> Hi, Michelle. Hi, Aaron. Oh, my God. Your, my, my fake screen is not as big as yours. You see the two edge. 
It's okay. I don't know. Nothing I can do. Sorry. You can. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. I'm ready to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Before you sleep, do you want to test out your slides? Yes. All right. Let's see. Michelle, you already did yours. Okay. Uh, oh, I have to share a screen, right? Yeah. Here we go. Um, is that good? Yeah, it looks great. It looks good. Is Occupy the, the whole thing or? Yep. Okay. Uh oh, why it doesn't go back now? Oh, it's frozen. Wow. Oh, wow. Wait, let's, uh oh, never happened. That's a cool corrosion cast. Yes, that's a real, uh, okay. Oh. Hi, can I try again? Yes. Maybe just so slow. It's okay, right? Yeah. Okay. So I, should I stop sharing? Uh, um, I don't. I don't see it, the sharing right now. What? No wonder it works. Okay. So when I share. Oh, great. But uh, when I share, right, let's see. we can see that now. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, great. Because you can see now? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to try the next slide? Next slide? This works. It's fine, right? Yeah, yeah, great. Right. Okay, good. So stop, where's the stop? So I, I should stop, okay. Yes. Um, so Michelle will go first, right? Right. Carol, Michelle. Hi. Hi. Hey. Hey. So, do, do you remember uh, Xiang Yu? Hong? Oh, of course. Right. He, he's my lab mate. Hey, so oh my here. God. Are you hey, also he, in, Are you also in Fudan? Uh, he, he's in Fudan. I'm. I mean, yeah. Cash Island. Yeah. Oh, I see. Are he's lab in Fudan now? A few years already. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Okay. I wish I can go to Shanghai, but still you have to quarantine for so long. Uh, maybe later this year, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. All... Yes. Yeah. We have some so long, I'm in Beijing now. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. Some friends that send me your uh, have given talks. We haven't we started to planning a uh, Code Team Harbor Asia meeting in Suzhou uh, September this year. I don't know, it's gonna happen. Really? Uh, it's probably <laughs> will happen. Um, yeah, we, we have another meeting happen in US. Uh, they invite us to be over in June this year. I said, oh. yeah, I can go if the policy allows. Yeah. I see. I want to go, yeah. So, I don't coming, know. Here, coming here should be no problem. But it, yeah, the real problem is when will come, come back <laughs> to China. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully. That's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I heard so you, uh, UCSF start to change all the seminar to online format to March. Uh, sad. Wow. For us, just first three weeks in January. Uh, maybe maybe people must figure out it's fine. Yeah, it's, it's no reason to panic. No. Yeah, we've but been doing online seminars so long yeah. for like two years. Uh, yeah, we've been uh, doing hybrid. Second anniversary as uh, this uh, April, right? It's, it's unbelievable. March 11th or 
So what about Michelle, the kids' schools? Are a lot of kids getting sick? A lot of kids are getting sick. The, our kids' schools are still open. My whole family's been, you know, home and quarantining, obviously, but um, hopefully they can go back. <laughs> What's so why, why, why are you quarantining? Oh, my entire family, including myself, uh, have, has breakthrough COVID. The, the new one. The, yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Not fun. But, but hopefully not so much symptoms, right? Really grateful. I got pretty sick, but really, really grateful. I'm sure it would have been so much worse without being vaccinated. Yeah. Did you, do you get a boost? Yep. I was boosted. Okay. Yeah. Because I heard um, if you don't get a boost, I think it's, well, it could be worse. Vaccination booster did everything yeah, we like. <laughs> I know, except we left our house. So, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, are our kids' schools still open? Yeah, at this rate, it seems like everyone in America will get it in the next couple of weeks or so. Yeah, yeah. I think they said like 25, 25% of tested ones now is positive or something. Well, yeah. there's, I think it's an under count because I know a lot of people who do the yeah. self test and then they don't, they don't, can't get an appointment for the nucleic acid test. So that's yeah. not counted. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're gonna get a herd immunity. Stay home and assume they have it. <laughs> not expose anybody. So no one, there's, there's a vast undercount for sure. Yeah. For us, for DeLong and I, it's different here. We just go for a test. We don't even have to check the report because if it's positive, they'll come to us. <laughs> they'll find yeah, out. You don't need to ask. Is your, yeah. is your iPhone uh, uh, green or yellow or something, right? Uh, you, you, yellow, it's you green. cannot go to cinema. You can't go to uh, see, uh, uh, movies, no. So all the uh, shopping malls and the movies, you will check your uh, code. The yellow, you cannot go to get anywhere. Um, but yellow doesn't mean you are infected, right? It's just been to you, it means you've been to somewhere and had some risk. But yeah. when, whenever we have a COVID test, we don't need to ask a result because if it turns out positive, uh, the doctor will, will show up your, on your door and mm. take over. So, and then your whole building will be locked up, uh, plus. The whole institute will be locked out. <laughs> yeah. You have like this, you have like this code where it sort of on your phone, it, it <clears> tells you like all the places you've been in the last 14 days. And um, I see. So yours is green yeah. color right now? Mine's mine's green. Yeah. It's green. Oh, it's green. Okay. <laughs> Can you just color it green? <laughs> I would do I would do that for sure yeah, for in past. California, but I, yeah. You figure out. I would, I yeah. So some people make a screenshot and uh, to pretend you are you are a screen and the the, the quickly the officials uh, figure out they, they have some touch pencils and try to touch the screen uh you just a screenshot you 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 test out right so it's, it's out to, to figure out how yeah to, so i see that i did that in i did that in beijing i made just a screenshot and i went to all the places and everyone let me in and then like i went to kfc and they caught me and, um, and then I had to like do the real one. I just did it because it's easier than having to scan each time. Okay, but it's different. Yeah. Here. Hi, Chinghua. Hi, Michelle. Oh, hi, Kong. Wow. <laughs> it's just you. your sunshine. Yeah. Well, the sun is, is down, so almost. Okay. Yeah. At least uh, ours is a peach black. Yes, that's right. That's right. You are, you guys are yes. well into your nights. Yes. Wow. Okay, so maybe we'll get started. Yeah, sure. Great. Okay. So hi, everyone. Welcome to another NeuroZoom, uh, Be Beijing edition today. And uh, before we get started with awesome talks, uh, advertisement for next week, we have um, Wei Wei from University of Chicago and Chang Liu from uh, Tianjin Medical University. Hopefully they're doing okay in Tianjin. And, um, but today we have um, really exciting speakers and it's a real privilege to introduce our first speaker, my colleague, Dr. Michelle Manji. Um, Dr. Manji 
uh, received her undergraduate degree at Vassar College uh, in New York. And then she um, did an MD PhD at Stanford with Theo Palmer. And here uh, she had uh, two uh, groundbreaking papers where she uh, explored the role of um, that when kids with brain tumors are treated with radiation, it causes uh, defects in neurogenesis. And she discovered that it's uh, actually, uh, contrary to expectation, the role of the environment and uh, inflammation, uh, local inflammation that inhibits this um, neurogenesis. And in a, in a series of papers in Nature Medicine and Science, uh, she worked out this mechanism and it, it, it really changes the way the field thinks about um, irradiation-induced uh, uh, inhibition of neurogenesis. Uh, she then uh, went to do residency training in neurology at Harvard Medical School at the Brigham and at MGH, and then came back to Stanford for more fellowship training and a postdoc uh, research with uh, Phil Beachy, where she uh, explored uh, the role of uh, hedgehog signaling and pediatric brain tumors. And um, in her own lab at Stanford, um, she makes breakthroughs in understanding brain tumors, the role of the microenvironment. She made key discoveries about the role of uh, neural neural activity in promoting brain tumor growth. She solved the mechanism by which uh, the synaptic neuroligin protein is secreted in an activity dependent manner. Um, Michelle is the quintessential physician scientist. She makes field leading basic discoveries in her research lab, but she's immensely dedicated to caring for her patients at the same time. She pioneers, uh, leads innovative clinical trials. Uh, she re received the um, presidential oh, early career award like for scientists no, and, and engineer. Like um, sorry about that. She, um, in then 2021, uh, three major awards. She became um, uh, HHMI investigator. She was awarded the uh, MacArthur Foundation uh, Fellowship, and then she was elected to the National Academy of Medicine. So it's an honor to have a great colleague like Michelle, and looking forward to her talk. Well, thank you so much for that introduction and so nice to be able to connect with everybody uh, virtually. Um, so today I'm going to speak about neuronglial interactions in health and disease. And really broadly speaking, my laboratory focuses on, on understanding the molecular language that cells use as they work together to build and remodel the brain. And I want to tell you one story today um, in two parts about the way in which neurons interact with the glial cells that form the myelin sheath in health, how we're beginning to an increasingly um, uh, understanding how this contributes to plasticity of neural circuit dynamics and, and um, underpins various neurological functions, and how these really powerful interactions between neurons and uh, glial cells are subverted in the context of glial malignancies. I'm a pediatric neuro-oncologist, and, and these are the diseases that I spend uh, most of my time thinking about in the laboratory and in the clinic. These are um, gliomas of childhood, which are a, a set of molecularly and clinically distinct disease entities that really intriguingly, and I think very tellingly, occur in a very predictable spatiotemporal pattern. So different gliomas happen in different parts of the nervous system at different ages. For example, um, low-grade gliomas of the optic nerve and pathway that are, are very common in the neurofibromatosis type one tumor predisposition syndrome tend to happen in very early childhood. These really terrible um, cancers of the brainstem and other midline structures that are driven by a particular mutation in, his, in a histone gene, um, uh, diffuse midline gliomas occur in the pons in mid-childhood around age six, in the thalamus um, a little bit uh, later in childhood around age 10 um, peak incidence, and in the spinal cord in adolescence. Uh, and these hemispheric high-grade gliomas that, that look um, very, very similar to glioblastoma in adults, but that are driven by a unique set of, um, of mutations in, in younger individuals, these tend to happen in adolescence and young adulthood. And this spatiotemporal pattern um, really, really suggests that there is some dysregulated process of neural development that, that underlies you know, the development of, of these terrible, terrible central nervous system cancers. And kind of considering this pattern, 
of gliomagenesis over um, childhood, adolescence, and young adulthood, you know, it, it struck me as, as a neuroscientist that this matches up pretty well with the developmental pattern of myelination, which um, as many people in this audience knows is really a protracted process of development in the human central nervous system beginning around the time of birth, but then spanning um, you know, about 30 years of neural development and occurring in really predictable spatial and uh, temporal patterns. Patterns. So for example, at a time when there's a discrete wave of developmental myelination in the ventral brainstem and the ventral pons um, in mid-childhood, this is when you know, one of the worst human cancers, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, tends to occur. And similarly, at a time when there's active myelination of the neocortex and intercortical association fibers, this is when um, hemispheric uh, high-grade gliomas of um, adolescence and young adulthood tend to occur. And these concordant patterns, um, you know, are really fit well with the observation from my lab and from many others that many forms of high-grade glioma, in fact, arise from precursor cells in the oligodendroglial lineage, either early oligodendrocyte precursor cells or um, glial-committed neural stem cells, and certainly fits with observations that uh, many of these tumors very closely resemble OPCs. And so this begs the very basic question, um, what regulates the proliferation and differentiation of these oligodendroglial precursor cells in, in normal development? Because we may glean important lessons about gliomagenesis by better understanding gliogenesis. And one, hy one hypothesis that's been in the literature um, in the myelin field for a number of years, but that until a few years ago was relatively controversial, is the idea that neurons themselves may regulate the behavior of these oligodendrocyte forming precursor cells and ultimately the oligodendrocytes that ensheath their axons to, to decrease transverse capacitance and increase the speed of neural impulse conduction. This was an idea that was first introduced actually by Ben Barris in the early 90s when he was a postdoctoral fellow with Martin Raff and then was supported by some really beautiful in vitro work and correlational work from uh, Doug Fields and from others. But because there are also very clearly activity independent modes of myelination, this remains somewhat controversial. And so when I started my own laboratory about 10 years ago now, um, this was one of the first questions that we really wanted to address. Um, do neuron glial interactions regulate um, adaptive experience dependent changes in myelin forming cells? Um, and, and can that biology then be hijacked in the context of glial malignancies? And to answer these questions, um, we leverage techniques in systems neuroscience uh, to, to better understand glial and glioma biology. And so I'm sure that everybody in the audience is well familiar with um, the technique of optogenetics, but just by way of review, um, optogenetics uh, allows for control of activity in targeted populations of neurons that express microbial light sensitive ions. So for example, if we express this blue light sensitive cation channel, channel rhodopsin 2, in cortical projection neurons and in cortical projection neurons of the uh, motor planning or premotor cortex in particular, we can then deliver blue light at the surface of the brain, stimulate action potentials in these uh, deep layer projection neurons, and in a, a mouse um, in which we have effectively recruited physiomimetic neuronal activity of these motor planning uh, neurons, we will elicit complex motor output. So then we know that we have um, successfully recruited activity in the circuit and can ask really straightforward questions about how other cell types within the stimulated circuit respond to changes in neuronal activity. And what we found, um, you know, a number of years ago now, um, in summary, in the interest of time, was that neuronal activity results in rapid and robust proliferation of oligodendrocyte precursor cells and generation of new oligodendrocytes that modulate the myelinated infrastructure, and that this contributes to modulation of behavior. Um, and so these relatively small changes that the new oligodendrocytes confer, either by myelinating previously unmyelinated axons or previously previously unmyelinated axon segments or through remodeling of existing myelin can tune circuit dynamics and, and overall promote coordinated circuit function.
We and others have been working hard to understand the mechanisms that underlie these adaptive changes in myelin forming cells. And, and one mechanism that we know um, is a required component of myelin plasticity, at least in cortical projection neurons, is activity dependent um, BDNF secretion signaling to the TREK B receptor on the oligodendrocyte precursor cell. And while the mechanism is almost certainly more complex than that, that, that required component um, of the adaptive response allows us, to, gives us kind of a molecular handle um, to specifically prevent activity dependent changes in myelination and then ask what role these activity dependent changes play in normal, um, in normal behavioral function. And what's emerging from, from our work and from many others is that these plastic changes in, in myelin forming cells contributes to attention, to memory and to learning. And, and we and others are working hard to understand um, more about the granular details of the mechanisms that underlie these really powerful interactions. One thing that I will point out is that um, there are real synapses between neurons and oligodendrocyte precursor cells, and passant synapses in, in um, the white matter and, and more traditionally appearing synapses in the gray matter. Dwight Burgles first described these in the early 2000s. And while they've been very well characterized, these so-called um, axoglial synapses um, are still poorly understood in the way that they contribute to myelin plasticity. But it is, it is believed by, by many in the field that these play um, a, a critical role yet to be determined. So, so what happens when the oligodendrocyte precursor cell is malignant rather than healthy? You know, could these interactions be subverted in the context of glioma? And so to ask that question, we did that same experiment that I just described for you, but this time in the, in the context of a diffusely infiltrating cortical glioblastoma isolated from a patient of mine. And what we found was that when we stimulate neuronal activity in the premotor circuit, that the malignant glioma cells increase their rate of proliferation and that this results in an overall increase in tumor burden, specifically within the stimulated circuit. So neuronal activity can promote um, brain cancer growth. Turning to another model and, and exploring this biology in low-grade gliomas, in collaboration with David Gutman's lab, um, we recently found that um, neuronal activity within the optic pathway and specifically within the optic nerve results in um, much larger tumors forming in a genetically engineered mouse model of optic pathway low-grade glioma compared to litter mate controls that were identically manipulated but not stimulated. And so this, this uh, relationship between neuronal activity and glioma progression is at play both in models of high-grade glioma as well as low-grade glioma. Now, this genetically engineered mouse model of optic pathway um, low-grade glioma is a really tractable system to begin to ask questions not only about glioma growth, but also about glioma initiation. In this mouse model, um, about 95% or more of the mice develop optic nerve tumors, and they do so at a really predictable time at nine weeks of age. And because the tumors are exclusively within the optic nerve, we can actually modulate that circuit activity by changing visual experience. And so if we take those mice and we simply place them in the dark around the time that uh, these tumors form, or just after the time period in which these tumors form, we find that far fewer and much smaller tumors form in dark reared mice compared to their litter mate controls that were raised with normal light exposure, with normal visual experience. And if we take those same, you know, that same mouse model and we instead place the mice in complete darkness just prior to tumor initiation at six weeks of age, no tumors form despite the genetic predisposition uh, to tumor, tumor genesis in this uh, tumor predisposition mouse model. And so what are the molecular mechanisms that are um, mediating these really powerful interactions between neurons and malignant glioma cells? We first hypothesized that there may be activity regulated paracrine factors um, driving glioma proliferation and growth. And so we did an experiment in which we took either cortical or retinal explants, and then we allowed those, we, uh, 
uh, collected condition medium from around those explants containing activity regulated secreted factors when the, the cortical explants or retinal explants were at varying levels of neuronal activity. So either spontaneously active, optogenetically stimulated or silenced um, with tetrodotoxin. And then when we take that condition medium con uh, containing the secreted factors and place them onto cultures of glioma cells, what we find is that there is a dose dependent increase in glioma cell proliferation and activity dose dependent increase. Now, gliomas are a family of molecularly and clinically distinct diseases, each with unique biology, but we find that the response to activity-regulated paracrine factors is conserved across multiple different forms of, of glioma from um, IDH wild-type pediatric or adult glioblastoma, from um, histone mutant diffuse intrinsic ponting glioma, IDH mutant anaplastic oligodendroglioma, and NF1-associated optic pathway glioma. So the next question is, what's in that condition medium? Through a series of biochemical and proteomic analyses, we found that there were two key activity-regulated secreted factors. Not unexpectedly, just as it plays um, an important role in healthy neuron glial interactions, BDNF was one factor that we found um, regulated in an activity-dependent way that promotes glioma proliferation. But really unexpectedly, we found this molecule Neuroligin-3, which um, I'm sure many people in the audience are very familiar with. Now, neuroligin-3 was quite a robust uh, glioma mitogen. And that was kind of a surprise. So, you know, we know that neuroligin-3 is a um, postsynaptic adhesion molecule. It, it plays important roles at both excitatory and inhibitory synapses, um, has recently gained some notoriety as there's a specific mutation in neuroligin-3 associated with an autism spectrum disorder, but it was not known to be a mitogen in any context. And actually it was not even known to be secreted, but we find that neuroligin-3 is cleaved at the membrane releasing this large N-terminal ectodomain in a strictly activity-dependent manner through the enzymatic activity of ADAM10, which is a metalloprotease that is itself activity-regulated in its secretion um, in, at the synap into the synaptic cleft. So the next question we asked was, what cell types are secreting neuroligin-3? Well, certainly neurons are a type of postsynaptic cell, but also remember oligodendrocyte precursor cells, OPCs, are postsynaptic. And we found through um, conditional deletion of neuroligin-3 in, um, in a cell type specific and inducible way that not only neurons, but really importantly, also OPCs contribute in a major way to the secreted pool of um, shed neuroligin-3. So we're working right now to understand what role neuroligin-3 plays in healthy OPCs and healthy myelin biology. So another story to come, come on that in the future. The next set of questions we asked was, you know, how important is this molecule? There are many, um, many cell intrinsic mechanisms by which brain cancer cells grow, as well as a number of microenvironmental mechanisms. In fact, I've just told you about two. Um, so we wanted to understand the relative importance of neuroligin-3 um, to glioma progression. And to do this, we simply xenografted patient-derived um, glioma cells into the environment of either the neuroligin-3 knockout or neuroligin-3 wild-type brain. And what we found was really unexpected. Rather than simply slowing growth, what we found was that gliomas did not progress in the absence of microenvironmental neuroligin-3. And that this apparent dependency on microenvironmental neuroligin-3 was conserved across multiple different forms of high-grade glioma, from pediatric glioblastoma to diffuse intrinsic ponting glioma, adult glioblastoma. But this dependency did not extend to a patient-drive model of breast cancer brain metastasis, suggesting that while this is important, biology across different forms of glial malignancies perhaps does not extend to all forms of brain cancer. We also found that neuroligin-3 was um, critical for the initiation and growth of um, those low-grade optic pathway gliomas. And in fact, that part of the predisposition to optic pathway glioma in the context of neurofibromatosis type 1 was upregulated activity-dependent secretion by NF1 mutant um, retinal ganglion cells. So I've just told you that neuroligin-3 is this really interesting therapeutic target and that ADAM10 is the enzyme that mediates its cleavage and release into the microenvironment. 
And so we wondered whether inhibiting ADAM10 might phenocopy this loss of neuroligin-3 and, and prove to be a useful therapeutic strategy. And so we tested that using a brain penetrant ADAM10 inhibitor that had been developed for a different reason and found excitingly that indeed across different forms of both high and low grade glioma, that there was a stark growth inhibition. I'm really pleased to report that this is a clinical strategy that I've recently brought um, to a national clinical trial and, and very hopeful that this will prove to be as useful for our patients as it is for our mice. But why is neuroligin-3 such an important mechanism? Well, um, you know, just to recap what we know, um, neuronal activity results in shedding of neuroligin-3 from postsynaptic cells through um, the enzymatic activity of ADAM10. That shed neuroligin-3 then binds to the glioma cell um, through a binding partner that we uh, are working very hard to identify. And, and then subsequent to the binding recruits numerous oncogenic signaling pathways. Now, this helps to explain the sufficiency of neuroligin-3 in promoting glioma cell proliferation, but it really doesn't explain that unexpected dependency. And so we dug deeper and looked at the gene expression changes attributable to neuroligin-3 binding. And what we found was that there was a number of different synapse-associated genes regulated by neuroligin-3. There's a feed forward effect of neuroligin-3 on its own expression together with upregulation of the BDNF receptor TREK-B, but also a number of different glutamate receptor subunits and other synapse-associated structural proteins. So this raised for us kind of a, what seemed at the time like a crazy idea that like there are neuron to glial synapses, perhaps there are also neuron glioma synapses. Well, when we look by immunoelectron microscopy in which we can unambiguously identify um, the malignant cells through immunogold labeling, we do see these really clear uh, synaptic structures between presynaptic neurons and postsynaptic glioma cells. Testing the idea that neuroligin-3 may be functioning to, to promote these synapses, we find far fewer of these structural synapses in the absence of microenvironmental neuroligin-3. But are these neuron to glioma synapses simply a shadow of the cell type from which these tumors emerged or are they actually functional? So in collaboration with Rob Malenka's lab, we performed whole cell patch clamp electrophysiology of glioma cells xenografted to the hippocampus just as a very tractable experimental circuit and then recorded from the glioma cells while stimulating the Schaefer collateral afferents into CA1. And what we found was that in every tumor we examined, there was a subpopulation of cells that exhibit excitatory postsynaptic currents. These are action potential dependent, blocked by tetrodotoxin. They exhibit multiple electrophysiological characteristics of bona fide synapses, including paired pulse facilitation, mini EPSCs. And more specifically, uh, this first type of synapse that we identified, we found to be AMPA receptor mediated. So we then wondered whether like other amperoceptor dependent glutamatergic synapses, there may be um, some degree of adaptive plasticity. And what we find is, what we have found is that indeed um, it, these malignant synapses exhibit, um, exhibit uh, adaptive plasticity in response to activity regulated BDNF. There is an increase in the amplitude of the current um, in the presence of BDNF compared to um, in cells that have, in which we've CRISPR deleted the BDNF receptor Trek B. And in multiple different ways, I'm showing you um, cell surface biotinylation um, assay of uh, the AMP receptor subunit GLUA4, we find that there's an increase in trafficking of AMP receptors to the postsynaptic membrane in the presence of BDNF, suggesting that these malignant synapses in an activity dependent way are um, becoming um, reinforced in the circuits that they invade. And so rather than just simply being a space occupying lesion, we find that gliomas are integrating into neural circuits. They're doing this through bona fide electrophysiologically functional neuron to glioma synapses that are elaborated and reinforced by a sort of malignant synaptic plasticity. There's also a second kind of electrophysiological response evoked by um, extracellular potassium. Um, and these potassium evoked currents are then amplified in a glioma to glioma um, coupled network. 
Now, given that glioma cells exhibit multiple um, mechanisms of membrane depolarization, we wondered whether that membrane depolarization alone was promoting its growth. And, and that would make sense because we know that during brain development, uh, neural precursor and stem cells are strongly regulated um, by membrane depolarization and in, through voltage sensitive mechanisms that remain to be fully determined. So we again turn to optogenetics, but this time rather than placing the light sensitive opsin in the microenvironmental neurons, we instead put them in the glioma cells. That allows us to depolarize the glioma cell membrane using light. And what we find is that if we optogenetically depolarize the tumor, that indeed that increases the rate of glioma cell proliferation. While conversely blocking glutamatergic neurotransmission, either pharmacologically or by expressing a dominant negative version of um, the AMPAR uh, subunit GLUA2 has a very stark inhibitory effect on glioma progression. So we can visualize these, this glioma um, uh, electrical activity using genetically encoded calcium indicators. And I think that really drives home this new realization that this cancer is an electrically active tissue. And that has not been the way that we have been approaching its biology or its therapy. So we're now working um, to understand mechanisms of malignant circuit assembly, plasticity, and evolution over the disease course, to understand the granular details of voltage-sensitive mechanisms of proliferation in both healthy and in malignant precursor cells. And I, I, I believe that you know, this biology will give us insights for normal neural development and plasticity magnified um, through this lens of glial cancers. In these studies, a number of different therapeutic um, potential targets are beginning to emerge. Um, as I mentioned, you know, blocking neuroligin-3 shedding, blocking neuroligin-3 binding, um, targeting AMPA receptors, BDNF to track B signaling. Um, I think we're really just at the tip of the iceberg in, in understanding uh, the neuroscience mechanisms that should be targeted in brain cancer. And the mechanistic parallels evident between normal and malignant neuron glial interactions really underscores the extent to which these cancers are just hijacking you know, normal mechanisms of neural development and plasticity and demand that we begin to approach these cancers from a neuroscience perspective. And I just wanna um, end uh, this talk to this uh, group of neuroscientists um, that you know, neuroscience is emerging as a critically important dimension of cancer biology really broadly, not just for brain cancer, cancers, but for tumors um, throughout the body. Many people to thank, I want to especially highlight Hamsa Venkatesh, um, who was a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory, um, who led much of the work that I just presented, um, Katie Taylor, um, Aaron Gibson, Anna Garrity, and Ewan Pan, our funding sources and collaborators. Hopefully I have a couple minutes left for questions. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks so much, Michelle, for that. Great talk. And we have time for questions. I have a question. The Adam 10 also sheds other uh, protein, mm -hmm. uh, among them um, C64CL1, right? The one that connects to microglia. So have you also look at the inflammation, which could affect the tumor growth? Yeah, so um, you know the ADAM10 inhibitor clearly is targeting multiple different um, substrates. You know, ADAM10 has has broad effects at synapses. I think the um, the bigger question is is what role do microglia play in neural circuit, you know, assembly and and, and refinement? And that that is a question that we're trying to answer right now. Just uh, another quick um, when you talk about glioblastoma. Uh, they're not necessarily oligodendrocytes, right? They could be emerge. They could emerge from other glia, right? So a, a, a wealth of um, a wealth of studies in the field have shown that um, high grade gliomas, for the most part, there's there's one clear exception, emerge from either neural glial restricted neural stem cells or oligodendric glial precursors. The, the field is traditionally thought of these as astrocytomas because the cells um, in, within the tumor become astrocyte-like or oligodendroglia-like. Every tumor has a mixture of both, but there is very little evidence that the tumors actually emerge from um, astrocytes. It's really a much earlier precursor cell, more oligodendroglial committed. So then you say that uh, 
condition that are demyelination should encourage tumor? I, I don't think that that's the case um, for, for complex reasons. I think that reflect, you know, the, all the changes in inflammatory diseases in the microenvironment. Thank you. <laughs> oh, hi, Michelle. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, can you hear me? I have a question I can, for you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm wondering, because you did this uh, uh, neural activity stimulation. Um, I'm wondering this paradigm, it's a very strong, like a stimulation, like a um, causal, like I'm just saying like enough, whether it's a physiologic range or like, like this, because um, looks like a uh, neural activity is bad for the new, uh, for the tumor growth. Then mm -hmm. um, is it possible to stop the neural activity? Cause, um, Cause that's also bad for the brain function. So what do you think about that? Thank you. Right. And, and so we're definitely not suggesting that patients should not have neural neuronal activity. Clearly the brain needs to function. It's our, it's our challenge to identify the mechanisms that we can target um, to try to decouple the tumor's um, dependency on, on its host. Um, and, you know, to your point about optogenetics being um, not physiological, I think this is why, you know, other experiments that we and others have now done modulating experience and looking at the effect of um, experience on um, tumor growth, you know, support the idea that uh, physio physiological neuronal activity is, is clearly important and, and at play. Um. We have a question in the chat from uh, Lubai, world's expert in BDNF. Maybe you can ask the question. Hi, very nice. Great Hi. talk. Fascinating. Um, uh, really, really impressive. Um, I have just one question about, uh, uh, have you tried uh, to block the BDNF for trap B signaling? And someone asked a question about a neuronal activity. So based on our experience, mm -hmm. uh, BDNF trap B signaling preferentially regulates those uh, activities are higher or those synapses that undergoes high uh, frequency transmission. So maybe by blocking uh, the BDNF trap B signaling, this is another way. Um, I mean, I, I, I know that the, uh, I was going to ask you about Adam 10, uh, uh, yeah. how the trial is going, what the stage is, but this is a, maybe another approach. Yes, and yes. Absolutely. And if you're interested, we may have um, inhibitors for that password. Uh, so I would love to follow up and talk with you. We have tried entrectinib, which is a pan track inhibitor. Um, so, you know, not a specific track B inhibitor, unfortunately, but we do find that that has a growth inhibitory effect in preclinical models. We've also CRISPR deleted the track B receptor from patient drive glioma mm -hmm. cells and, so, and find mm -hmm. that that actually has quite a stark um, survival advantage in preclinical models, much more so than we would have expected based on um, just the role of BDNF as a mitogen, which is actually why mm -hmm. we started looking for roles of BDNF um, in, in modulating the synaptic biology, because we thought that might be the more important role. Yeah. Um, so our approach is to have um, antagonist antibodies, uh, the trap specific antibodies. Uh, mm -hmm. So that may have, a, you know, you, one shot, it takes, you know, the, the PK is about a two weeks. So mm -hmm. you just do one injection and can last very long. That's um, uh, I have another question that uh, the glioma is a very heterogeneous. In yes. other words, uh, so far you've been focusing on the OPC derived uh, um, gliomas, but they are uh, microglia derived, the uh, exercise derived. Um, and even within uh, the uh, specific cell type derived, there are many different types of uh, glioma. Is there any specificity of this password that you described? Yeah. Um, so the vast majority of glioma types arise from oligodendroglial precursor cell or, or earlier stem cells. There's one um, molecularly distinct form that actually arises from interneuron precursors, which is a very interesting mm -hmm. and, and very different kind of tumor. Um, what we um, 
have found is that in the pediatric high grade gliomas, these, these, the ones driven in the midline of the nervous system by the histone mm-hmm. three mutation, those are a much less heterogeneous tumor type than oh, adult okay. GBM, which is mm-hmm. very changeable and heterogeneous and protean, but this mm-hmm. histone three, because it's an epigenetic mechanism driving glioma pathogenesis, mm-hmm. almost all the cells are OPC like, and they are kind of in wow. this differentiation stranglehold. And this tumor um, is, ex- is, exquisitely driven by neuronal activity, engaging in multiple different forms of, um, of synapses, glutamatergic and GABAergic, um, and really dependent upon this biology. In adult GBM, you're absolutely right. It's a heterogeneous disease that has four different major um, cell states. And three mm-hmm. of those four seem to be very dependent upon neuronal activity for both invasion mm-hmm. and growth, but the more mesenchymal uh, type evades this biology. And so as we you know, think about therapeutic targeting, especially of you know, adult GBM, which can be so protean, we're gonna have to think about how to um, get all of the different cell states. Great, thanks very much. We yeah. should nice follow up. Yes, I'll send you an email. Thank you. Yeah, okay, bye-bye. Okay, um, thanks, Michelle. There are a ton of other questions, and I, I wonder if while Chunghua is talking, if you could answer those in the chat box, That's and um, that would be great. But th- thanks so much. I think you're the first speaker we've had who with COVID during the talk, so that, that's been great. We've had a couple <gasps> who's recovered, but that, thanks for that. I really appreciate you, you coming. Um, DeLong, you're up for introducing my great friend Chung Sure, good. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thanks, thanks Michelle, for great talks. I will type my question on the chat t- as well. Great. So uh, it's my good pleasure and honor to introduce another uh, HHMI investigator, also investigating uh, interesting neural, non-neural cells uh, for functions, uh, with Professor Chung Gu in Harvard Medical School. So after a PhD in Cornell Medical School, uh, Chen Hua uh, did her postdoc with David Ginty, where he started a very interesting line of work, uh, which is very unique uh, question to asking how the uh, is a blood brain barrier BBB is formed by affecting a, a interesting line of uh, molecules, uh, including um, morphogens and some some where uh, she she have an initial uh, a meeting study uh, showed that some some foreign molecules has been played a critical role. So after her, uh, she started her own lab in Harvard Medical School, she has a, a, a discovered amazing uh, fun- function role of a lipid uh, associated protein, caviola, uh, has an amazing role of regulating blood uh, BBBs formations, which has a providing has a lot of insight how to manipulate the BBB and may- maybe has an interesting role on, in treatment of uh, neurological disorders. Okay, so today, uh, Chenghua will share us uh, her latest about the uh, regulating me- mechanism of our uh, uh, blood brain barrier. Okay. Yeah. Let me share the screen. Sure, great. Welcome. All right. It's, it, it's, uh, you can see it, right? Yeah, take it away. Great. All right, great. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you guys for organizing uh, such a fantastic seminar series. Um, yeah, so um, today I'm going to um, share with you some recent work on addressing the mechanism underlying the neurovascular interactions in the brain. Um, Okay, so this is actually a a human vascular cast, just to give you a sense of the brain, right? So just give you a sense of how densely vascularized our brain is. As a matter of fact, as a result, every neuron is less than 15 micron away from a capillary. And uh, also the brain is obviously a very expensive organ, even at rest right now, like you're listening to my talk, um, the small brain all, only occupies 2% of body weight, but actually consume 20% of energy. And, then, and you know, unlike liver and other organs, brain doesn't have a capability to store energy. Um, finally, um, neurons, we all know, are extraordinarily sensitive to their extracellular environment. So facing those challenges, luckily, uh, our brain come up with a unique way to supply the blood to the brain, which is very different from the uh, periphery system, in, in ma- mainly in two ways. One is to meet the moment-to-moment demand of energy. Uh, neuroactivation increase the local blood flow, so this process is called neurovascular coupling. And... Um, Oops. Okay. Um, 
and the uh, brain's camelomilu must be tightly controlled, and this is obviously achieved by the blood moon barrier. Uh, so today, I'm just uh, due to the interest of time, I'm only going to uh, talk about the blood moon barrier and share with you uh, two stories, uh, one's published, one's not, um, to just give you a sense of what our uh, current progress on addressing this. Uh, so in general, my lab's interest in understanding the basic mechanisms underlying uh, blood moon barrier and nervous coupling. Okay, so we're a bunch of neuroscientists and we all really appreciate the existence of the bottom barrier. Uh, basically, it's a, it's a gatekeeper of the brain. It controls what's in and out of the brain, um, the ion neutron homeostasis, and also have a protection um, to, to uh, protect the brain from the toxins passengers. And the only um, thing can freely go through, mainly um, small lipid um, uh, molecules and uh, um, oxygens. Um, so um, it's also have a limit entry of the immune cells. Um, so here's just a cartoon version uh, of the blood-brain barrier. So you see a capillary running towards us and there's a single layer of endothelial cells, which I'm gonna talk a lot about, form the wall of the blood vessel. Um, those cells uh, constitute the blood-brain barrier. And here the astrocyte and feet hugging the blood vessels that we call unfeed. And in between, there's a little cell type called parasite I'm also going to touch upon. And the green stuff in the background is your favorite axons, dendrite, and, uh, and synapses. So uh, no doubt have a very uh, tight, um, tightly regulated blood brain barrier is very important for normal brain function. By the same time, it's also one of the biggest obstacles for treating any neurological diseases, right? So I listed all of them here. Uh, so in this case, so we wish we could transiently open the barrier to allow the um, drug to go in. Um, on the other hand, a recent work suggests that the barrier breakdown, breakdown precedes neurodegeneration. So in this case, uh, we actually hope we could actually tighten the barrier to delay the disease progression. So understanding the basic molecular mechanism uh, give rise to the blood barrier, um, we will put us in a unique position to be able to um, manipulate the barrier in either directions for treating diseases. Okay, so just a few words about a little bit history of a blood brain barrier. Um, the concept actually arrived in uh, rise in uh, in the early 1900s. Oops, it depends. Okay, um, so uh, Paul Ehrlich and his students inject some water soluble blue dye into the Telvin of the red that the red running around for some time. And then they just simply dissect all the organs. And it was something really, uh, astonishing happened. Um, what they saw is that every organ turned blue except the brain and the uh, spinal cord. Um, so of course, there's many interpretations of this result, but one of them was that perhaps it indicated there's a physical barrier between the uh, blood and the central nervous system. So from this concept to actually localize the, the cell types uh, actually constitute the barrier took another 60 years until seminal work by Tom Reese and Morris Klosky in the uh, 1960s by Electro uh, Markovsky. So here, what they did is that they took advantage of HRP, horse virus proxies, um, and uh, after the AB reaction and the EM electron dense, right? So what they did is they inject HRP to the um, telving of the, the mice and then um, cut the brain sections, look at them under EM. So one thing has become very clear that you can see, um, you can see my mouse, right? So, so here's the lumen, you can see dark, that's HRP, and stop very sharply at the tight junctions between two neighboring endothelial cells. Um, so this is for the first time demonstrating that the very property is actually resides in the endothelial cells, not astrocyte and feed, not many other things people have been speculated up to that, that point. Um, so clearly there's something special about this uh, tight junction because it can stop the uh, HRP. In contrast, um, I just want to point out that this is a, a periphery um, uh, blood vessels. And you can see the lumen almost have nothing left. Um, the HRP freely can pass through the tight junction. So clearly compared to this tight junction to here, it's day and night difference. Um, and because of that, um, the uh, specialized tight junctions has been contributed attribute to the main reason underlying the restricted nature of the uh, barrier. 
Um, but I also want to draw your attention that you notice here a lot of uh, trees are containing vesicles only observed in the periphery endothelial cells, which are leaky, but you never see them in the CNS endothelial cells. Um, so hopefully by the end of my talk, uh, I can convince you that uh, it's not because uh, um, the CNS endothelial cells doesn't have those vesicles, but rather they actively have to suppress this um, uh, transcellular um, passage. Okay, um, so when we, um, uh, just a couple of years ago, when I remember I clearly when I um, look at those uh, beautiful pictures, um, you know, I was thinking about, um, this, is a, this is a really stark contract between the, uh, they're both endothelial cells, but one's leaky, one is not. Um, so I think um, we would like to know what are the molecules actually give rise to such a distinct um, subcellular features as a result, one is leaky, one is not. So to do that, um, basically we're focused on endothelial cells, try to um, identify all the molecular specializations give rise to this uh, um, cellular, uh, cellular and physiological difference. Uh, so first I'd like to thank the people who've done the work. Um, so this is a pioneered by um, a two formal postdocs, A.L. Benzivi and Baptist Lacoste, both of them are, um, have their own lab right now. Um, AL just tenured in the uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem and Baptist in, in uh, University of Ottawa. And the recent work is done by two very talented uh, neuroscience uh, graduate students, also former graduate students, they just graduated. Um, okay, so what AL did is um, to unbiasedly uh, isolate endothelial cells from the brain, which have the barrier compared to the transcriptions um, in the endothelial cells from the lung, was just leaky. And of course, as a lot of the genes are different, we're particularly interested in the genes enriched in the uh, brain of the cells and the very low expression in the lung in the fetal cells. Um, so the, about like 300 of them encode very interesting list of genes. Um, so um, first I'm going to tell you one of the genes that we've been studying for the past few years and we learned a great deal about uh, basic mechanism uh, underlying the uh, blood and barrier is called MFD2A, is a multi transmembrane protein. Um, so, when we, um, so this is already uh, published, I'm just going to summarize the result. So, first of all, when we uh, knock out this uh, gene, uh, normally this is a basically a fancy way of doing uh, the leakage assay, uh, similar to Paul Urge and his student. This is by uh, red. Uh, uh, dextrin tracer, and you can see in the brain, uh, the tracer is completely confined in the blood vessels. You don't see anything in the brain parenchyma. In contrast, in the mutant mice, you see the tracer leak out of blood vessels, stay in the brain parenchyma. But to our surprise that um, this leakage is not due to the opening of junctions. If we do the same experiment, HRP injection, you can see even the mutant, the HRP also stop very sharply at the tight junctions, indicating the tight junctions functionally working. Um, but in contrast, when we look at transcytosis, something was really um, uh, amazing. If you still remember the, the, periphery, in the, the periphery blood vessels, the uh, EM I showed you a couple of slides ago. So basically, sim simply just now call one gene, you, you have this tracer containing vesicles all of a sudden show up in the endothelial cells of the CNS endothelial cells. So it's almost like you knock out one gene, you already converted the in CNS endothelial cell phenotype to a periphery leaky uh, phenotype. So to make a long story short, um, we identify those are through the uh, cavioli vesicle pathway and the uh, cavioli uh, vesicle formations depends on this cavioli protein. So in the mutant mice without the cavioli protein, this vesicle will not form. So here just simply showing the immuno EM of cavioli one decorated cavioli vesicle in the MFD2A mutant mice. Um, so we find that um, MFC2A suppressed transcytosis actually specifically by blocking cavioli formation. So here's some evidence. Um, I already showed you be before in the single mutant mice, you see the increase of vesicles here I colored in for you. Uh, however, when we cross with MFC2A with cavioli one mice without, this mice doesn't have cavioli vesicles, this phenotype is completely rescued. 
mirror this result, the leaky phenotype also complete rescued. So this indicating that indeed this upregulation of uh, cavity vesicles account for this leakage phenotype. Therefore, normally MFC2A suppress cavity formation. How does this happen? To make a long story short, um, MFC2A is a lipid transport. It's more like a um, flea piece. So basically um, can flip the unsaturated phospholipid, including DHA, omega-3 fatty acid, um, to, from the outer membrane to the inner membrane. And this um, changed the lipid composition in an environment that inhibit cavioli formation. So as a result, when we uh, unbiasedly isolate the capillaries from the brain versus the lung, do an unbiased lipidomic analysis, we actually see the major difference from the lipid composition, indeed is DHA containing phospholipid. So to, to kind of summarize, um, at least this well the mechanism explains how the CNS endothelial cells manage to keep a very low rate of transcytosis. Um, so in the um, in, the, in the brain endothelial cells, in the CNS endothelial cells, because of the unique expression of this MFC2A, it's changed the lipid uh, composition. As a result, constantly inhibit cavioli formation. So if you do a snapshot like EM, you actually rarely see those vesicles. In contrast, if you see the lung endothelial cells, um, the cavioli vesicles freely form. So you do a snapshot, you actually see a lot of those vesicles under the EM. Um, so obviously this is just a tip of iceberg, um, but it's already taught us one thing previously we didn't know because historically uh, specialized tight junctions are the major con uh, contributor to, uh, to explain why the barrier is impermeable. Um, so here we discover that um, CNS endothelial cells actually have a machinery actively inhibit the transcytosis. So you need both to uh, prevent the paracellular and transcellular together to ensure the barrier integrity. So um, obviously, you know, this is a great beginning, but I, I, I told you we have like 300 candidate genes. So right now we're actually uh, investigating what are the rest of them are a key uh, component of the um, BBB um, in the endothelial cells. Um, and uh, we're, I also want to point out that uh, there's actually four unique features of the CNS endothelial cells uh, compared to the periphery endothelial cells. Uh, what is that? Um, it's weird. Um, so besides the specialized tight junction, low rate trans... Whoa. Oh, I don't know what happened. Um, do you guys see all the joy? Right. Sorry about I that. I, I, it I just erased it. Part of it. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so, um, so also, uh, obviously, you still have the necessary nutrients uh, able to come to the uh, inside the brain and the waste come out. So you have uh, hundreds of uh, specific influx and efflux transporters expressed in the brain of fetal cells, and then also have a very low leukocyte adhesion expression to prevent uh, immune cell entry. Uh, so from those candidate genes, uh, we're also discovering um, component to give rise to other unique features. Um, but else, by this point, I want to um, um, to uh, zoom out a little bit, go back to the initial pictures. I want to point out, although endothelial cells constitute the berry property, the berry property are not intrinsic to the endothelial cells, but require active induction maintenance from the brain environment. Um, so for the remainder of the time, I'm gonna share with you unpublished uh, uh, work um, talk about what are uh, how the blood and barrier properties are maintained by the local environment. Um, so particularly if you look at the EM of a piece of tissue of a cortex, so here is the uh, lumen of the blood vessel of the capillary. You can see it's, a, it's a formed by the endothelial cells. And uh, right next to it is actually share the same basement membrane as the cell types called parasite. And then in addition, AS means the astrocyte unfeed. So given this uh, uh, physical interaction, we speculated maybe parasite and astrocyte actually, uh, the prime uh, suspect can actually signal to the endothelial cells maybe contribute to the maintenance. Um, so I'm going to um, share with you 
um, a story. Uh, indeed, uh, you know, this is very highlighted by a very uh, talented postdoc Swafi uh, in the lab, showing that um, the we identify one of the first uh, cues from, come from secreted from the parasite and and bind to the receptor expressed on the endothelial cells. This cell cell interaction actually. Uh, is required to maintain the barrier property. And this also um, in collaboration with uh, Ben Shellstad from Stanford with his, her postdoc uh, Wei Zhang. Okay, so for that, we actually moved it from the brain to the retina. You know, retina is also a piece of, um, it's a part of a CNS. Um, so the reason is the blood vessel in the retina, this is a flat mount, you can see at P, P1 to P8, is basically the vessel sprouting from the optic nerve head from the uh, center to the periphery. Um, interestingly, previously, we our lab already shown that as the vessel grow out from the center to the periphery, the um, newly formed vessel is actually leaky, but the, uh, the vessel formed a couple of days ago uh, becomes sealed. Uh, have a functional barrier. So we decided to take advantage of this dynamic process. Basically, both of them are covered by the parasite. We're just wondering what's the difference, why this is leaky and this is not, right? Obviously the local environment is very different. So we were looking for specific genes coming from parasite are different from the front leaky region versus the uh, sealed region. So one of the genes are vitronectin. Vitronectin is an extracellular matrix protein. And here you can see by antibody staining in the front, which is leaky, uh, have almost no expression of the protein versus the proximal region, you have a very high expression. When the berry is sealed, you have a very high expression of this molecule. And here just showing the brain is the same way. Um, so, so this um, enriched in the CNS parasite, um, but not in the thelial cells, uh, and also um, highly enriched in CS parasite compared to the periphery tissue again. So it's very unique. Um, so what happened to the vitronectin knockout mice? So here again in the control uh, um, with the tracer, and uh, you can see the very obvious uh, leakage. Um, here's the uh, quantification. And um, this leakage not only limits the small tracers, also large tracers and the leakage also persistent to the adult food. Uh, importantly, despite the leakage, the vascular patterning is normal. Um, and here you can see, so, so everything else is normal. So, so that means uh, this uh, vitronectin is uniquely required for the barrier integrity. And here's in the cerebellum, you can see also clearly leakage here, uh, quantification here. Um, so what? So then we of course ask what the subcellular uh, basis for this. I already introduced you to specialized tight junctions and transcytosis. And again, the junction seems functional. However, um, so here both in the retina and cerebellum. However, when you look at the um, transcytosis again, we see this tracer containing vesicles in the um, in the thelial cells, both in the retina and also in the cerebellum. Here's the quantification. Um, okay, so, so then we have to step back, right? So here we're saying when you knock out the gene expressed in the parasite, it actually affect the neighboring cells uh, barrier property. Uh, how, how could this happen, right? So there are several possibilities. So first is uh, maybe does lack of the vitronectin affect parasite recruitment, right? So maybe all the parasites have died, that therefore you, you, you see the leakage. Or um, it's an extracellular matrix protein, maybe loss of this molecule, you act, you don't, you, this extracellular matrix is not intact anymore. Therefore, as a consequence, you have the leakage. Or the third possibility, we all know vitronectin binds to integrin. So maybe it's a unique ligand receptor interaction between the parasite and in the thelial cells. It's a unique signal actually um, determining the barrier property. So to make a long story short, this first two are not true. Uh, I'm going to show you some evidence supporting the, num the third. Okay, so um, just a few words about um, integrin signaling. So uh, it's basically well known, it's involved in many aspects of cell biology. Um, it's a mem control membrane tensions, outside in signaling, usually you need alpha beta hydrodimer. Um, for vitronectin as a ligand, it's well known that it's required a three key amino acid motif called RGD. 
um, as uh, the three three amino acid is very important to bind to integrin. If you mutate RGD to RGE, you completely abolish integrin binding. So luckily, there's a mouse RGE um, now in available. So we obtain the RGE mutant mice and look at the leakage and basically um, completely recapitulate the full knockout phenotype. You see the leakage about the same severity. Um, so just to just to tell you the result without showing you uh, basic the leakage in cerebellum also um, and have functional tight junctions, increased transcytosis. Basically just a point mutation abolish its ability to bind to integrin have this uh, mimic the null phenotype. So obviously it's pointing to some kind of an integrin receptor. So the, our next goal is to find out which specific integrin receptor in the endothelial cells are mediate this uh, communication. Um, so it, it's actually very complicated because there's so many alpha form, beta form, but luckily for us, we only need to consider two alpha, alpha 5, alpha V, because alpha, uh, alpha 5, V are the only two compressed, all the RGD-based uh, integrin receptors that actually vitrodentin bind to, and both of them are expressed in endothelial cells. So, um, so here we use endothelial cell specific Cre driver, Cre ER, um, and um, you can see um, this after tamoxifen injection, the anti the antibody staining of alpha five. You can see the vessel expression of the um, alpha five is completely gone. Um, oops. Okay. Um, here, just to show alpha-5 is actually in the endothelial cells and uh, uh, versus previously I showed you the vitronectin in the parasite. Um, so what is the phenotype? So here again, you, you clearly see the uh, leakage, uh, very similar to the vitronectin mutant phenotype. Um, and uh, this is the, uh, this is the um, cerebellum phenotype, very similar. However, in contrast, when we do exactly the same experiment, specifically now called alpha V, um, there's no phenotype at all. So clearly uh, alpha five integrin is the receptor for the um, vitronectin. So what is the mechanism? Um, turn out that in many cell culture based experiment it's well established that uh, ECM integrin interactions actually control the membrane tension. And when the membrane tension uh, decrease, you encourage in those endocytosis. So you can you can kind of intuitive, right? When the membrane become flop, uh, you kind of easier for the um, for the curvature to form uh, and have uh, endocytosis. So the idea is that basically vitronectin bind to the integrin generate adhesive forces normally. When you lose it, um, you kind of encourage the uh, endocytosis. And here are some uh, examples of of that when the cells uh, move from acetonic, you know, from hypotonic to acetonic, basically you artificially change the membrane tension and you clearly see the uh, increase of um, endocytosis. So we decided to do this precise experiment to test whether this is the underlying mechanism biophysically uh, in primary endothelial, brain endothelial cells. So here um, you can see only in the presence of vitronectin, you can see the uh, alpha-5 um, activation. There's a FAC focal adhesion molecule indicating the activation. And here, when we, um, we use the two independent SHRNA in the cells and doing the endocytosis assay, and you can see that compared to the scramble SHRNA, which with very little endocytosis, you have increase of uh, endocytosis here. So here's the... Um, uh, quantification. So indeed, this is the uh, mechanism. This in vitro assay is done by uh, Wei Zhang in Ben Xiao's lab from Stanford University. Um, okay, so um, basically to summarize, um, we discovered that the, the vitronectin secreted by parasite in the CNS endothelial cells specifically bind its receptor integrin alpha-5. As a result, the signaling is particularly inhibit the transcytosis pathway as a result to um, maintain the low rate of uh, transcytosis, ensure the barrier integrity. So I just want to use this slide to summarize uh, this little aspect of uh, blob and barrier regulation. Um, it's, when you zoom out, it's quite, uh, 
unexpected, um, at least for me, when I first started this line of work. So it turned out to be, we discovered two mechanisms, both involved in uh, biophysical properties of the uh, of the endothelial cell plasma membrane, right? So the first uh, MFD2 st story is uh, about membrane lipid composition. And the second one is about membrane tension. Those biophysical properties as a result is super, super important to maintain um, a low rate of transcytosis. So together with the specialized tight junctions to ensure the CNS endothelial cells um, have an intact barrier. Um, so, um, you know, if you if you want to have one take home message, basically is that um, we, I'm, I'm telling you both uh, intracellular and intracellular signaling are required to have the blood brain barrier property. So um, in the endothelial cells is more intracellular signaling um, that is give rise to the barrier property. However, equally important, the neighboring cells, perivascular cells communicating with the endothelial cells to maintain those properties actually uh, sustain. Um, so together we, we can have a, a intact problem barrier. Um, okay, so uh, here, I, I think I acknowledge people already here. Uh, this is the funding and uh, this is a picture we took right before the pandemic in the snowy Boston. Uh, okay, so I, I can answer some questions. Great. Uh, Kang raised his hand already, please. Hi, Chunghua. That was really Oh, hey, Kang. Hey. Um, so I wonder, um, so when you use a tracer as a measure of transcytosis, right, and uh, uh, you see these electron-dense uh, structures, and then they are caviolin-mediated uh, uh, vesicles. So I wonder... Are there other, you know, cells are, I'm sure these endothelial cells also have a very robust uh, classroom coated pits and other yes. type of uh, uh, endocytic mechanisms. So uh, when you use different type of tracers, let's say, you know, something more physiological, uh, mm -hmm. uh, LDL receptor, uh, LDL particles, uh, when they, do they also go through caviolin uh, mm -hmm. or do they go through uh, different mechanisms? And if that's true, then you know, by showing that there are specific inhibitor inhibitory uh, factors for the caviolin system, is there like a more physiological functional assays that you can test your model with? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one thing about the caviolin, in a way, is is good because it's a, it's not really very picky. It's a it's basically can um, can gobble in in a way large <laughs> like IgG type of uh, large molecules and also small molecules for therapeutics is very good, right? It's not like a transparent receptor or something you, you're very limited with it. So, um, so you can, yeah, we have tried, you can give antibody enzyme, you know, all kinds of things um, can, yeah. it's pretty much like when the things that you inject in the blood flow, you know, happen to be there, they can just come. I, I agree. The reason I asked is because, uh, you know, there are be, now the utilizing transferring receptors is a yeah. way to concentrate yeah. and people are exploring the possibility of using that to guide the delivery of drug into the brain, right? So. Right, exactly, right. So this is a very distinct, I think there's a lot of advantage um, over, over that. Yeah. Okay, uh, Sheng is next. Sheng? Uh, uh, hi, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, hi. Yeah. Are yeah. you hear me? Yeah, some yeah. echo here. Echo. Yeah. Wow. Uh, oh, sorry for that, like, because I also have my iPad there. Uh, just question, a uh, beautiful talk. So you are talking about the, for the second, your uh, second your story about the integrin that's from the uh, extracellular matrix. So as you also mentioned, there are so many different integrins. What makes this alpha-5 so special? Do you have any <laughs> insight on that? Well, I think, first of all, right, there's not so many actually uh, expressed in the CNS in the thelial cells. And then I'm talking about particular ligand, right? So that helps already narrow down only two candidates to consider, right? Uh, whether why alpha V and alpha five are, uh, you know, one doesn't have a phenotype, one does. Uh, we know alpha five actually uh, more highly expressed in the 
in the thelo cells versus alpha V, even though it's named V supposed to be more, but actually much less. Uh, maybe that 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 is the reason. Okay, thanks. thanks. Oh, so beautiful talk, uh, Chen Hua. So actually, kind of tagging along, Kang mm -hmm. asking uh, like uh, the other extreme. So instead of the ex extreme natural situation, let's think about you know, all the AAVs of different serotypes that they previously yeah. heard talk about. So what is really determining that aspect of transcytosis versus mm -hmm. some got labeled the CNS neuron better, some only like say all the BR1 or whatever, only labels endothelial yeah. cells. What, what's your thinking on that? And also associated with that is you pick the example of retina, which is one of my favorite. And, mm -hmm. but do these two areas have a little bit more lichenous than the rest of the cerebral cortex? No, I, I was very surprised. Uh, if anything, I think spinal cord may be a little bit less or even cerebellum, but uh, retina, surprisingly, it's a really so far, we didn't see anything less. So retina shouldn't be the second class citizen of the CNS. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's doing something like a require quite a um, high level of uh, intact barrier. Um, and your first question about AV, I think is very, very interesting. You, I, I think the whole neuroscience uh, uh, field is using the, um, the, uh, the one um, can actually pass the, the, e, the pH, right, to pass the barrier. But on the other hand, we also use uh, the ones in the fetal cell specific uh, virus. Uh, we suspect it's utilized uh, vesicle uh, pathway is just a, which particular receptor, right? You know, the different uh, type of receptor, you know, it's like a so strain unique and all of that. Um, and, um, uh, I, I, but I think in a hijack, what type of vesicle pathway, it's not clearly um, defined yet. Um, but I think most likely it goes through the, the vesicle trafficking pathway. Yeah, I, I think it's a very, very uh, interesting question. It's just a, it take a while to figure out. Okay, J Jimmy, next. Right. Uh, go ahead. Uh, hey, um, can you hear me? Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, oh, I um, should stop sharing so everyone can. Okay, my question is, uh, when you knock out a Vic, uh, Victronectin is universally knockout, right? But uh, what you see, the BBB leaking is like a big puncta form. I just wonder, this is a random phenomenon or is some molecular machine underlying or to determine where it's to be leaked? Well, and where yeah, so, so I didn't have time to, uh, I mean, the reviewer asked us, we just, you, we just did that experiment. So uh, people in the Victronectin field should know, um, also you have a, blood um, circulating vitronectin mainly secreted by the liver, right? So we, we have done an experiment basically took advantage that you can inject SIRA, right? Because of liver, right? So it doesn't go through and go into liver and it's so successfully knocked down and there's no phenotype at all. So that's why it rule out the possibility that circulating vitronectin contribute to this phenotype, right? So. So, so even though we don't, we didn't have the cell type specific for the parasite, but the mainly two sources, one is a circulating one that we kind of rule out the, the circulating. Um, okay. okay. Yeah. Another question is, is there any strategy to acutely affect the parasite in vivo? Like no, that's parasite? that's like many, many labs. Try yeah, exactly. We have the AAV like BR1 or something for brain in the video cells, but we ha we don't have that yet. But re recently there's a potential Cree driver. So we're we're testing right now. All right, all right. Thank you so much. Wonderful yeah. talk. Great. Thanks. All right, thanks. There are two more questions on the chat board. So uh is is a little, a little bit of over time. So yeah, I, I want to uh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, um, in your work, especially in regard to the alpha five, but maybe to other, did you make the distinction between um, uh, our, uh, and arteries and, and, and veins and maybe capillaries? Yeah, um, so uh, turn out that uh, even for cavioli, right? Uh, even MFC2A, MFC2A it's highly expressed in the capillary. So first of all, berry property strictly is in the capillary. And then for example, MFC2A we discover is 
absent in the arterial endothelial cells. And we have a separate paper talk about the neurovascular coupling. And they actually have tons of, uh, um, because you don't have MFC2A, you have a lot of uh, cavioli. Cavioli is very important for neurovascular coupling. So basically arterial endothelial cells main function is actually, you know, vasodilation is involved in the neurovascular coupling. And then capillary is mainly function as the, um, blob and barrier. And it's a, even though it's a, both in the fetal cells, both in the CNS, the different segment actually have a different, very different molecular signature. Thank you. Great. Uh, two more questions, Chair Bar. Do you ask, want to ask you a question yourself or uh, Chenghua just could type in the, the, your answers on the chat bar? So it's usually late. So uh, yeah, I think it's Maybe uh, Aaron, you can you can leave meeting here, and uh, uh, Chenghua could uh, type her uh, answer in the chat bar. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Chenghua. Okay. Michelle, has a great talks today. It's great attendance. Uh, super great. talk today. Great. Thank you so much. Um. Yeah. Aaron, Bye. Uh, yeah, you can leave here and uh, uh, leave here for uh, a few minutes. Uh, yeah. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, I'll be here. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Great. Great. Thanks, Chenghua. Michelle, um, see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Chung Hong. Bye. We, we can go now, right? Yeah, the two more questions um, on the board. Yeah, you can spend a few minutes. Oh, I yeah, see. Great. Okay. Thanks, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great talk, Shane. Right. Oh, yeah. Great talk, to Michelle, too. Yeah. Hopefully, one day we can uh, get together in person. I look forward to that. <laughs> yeah. Bye. 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 Bye, Michelle. Take care. Oh, so I just type back on the chat, you mean? Yeah. And then you save the chat? Um, Which one you're talking about? Which question? Uh, oh. Chu, Chu Xuan, who? Oh, I see. OK, then. Under the top uh, yeah. Oh, uh, sure. That's very, very generic, right? So the. Yeah. So I just type to everyone. Yeah. Or just him. Type everyone. Uh, yeah, everyone's fine. Oh, okay. Oh, they both pathological. Oh, they both ask me. I can just write the same thing, right? Yeah. 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 Actually, Chenghua, I'm going to jump off, but uh, it was good to see you. And uh, Oh, yeah, good to see you, too. Please come visit China. <laughs> I want to, if I don't have to uh, do the quarantine. The, the quarantine is not so bad. I'll, um, I'll get you uh, delivery, like why my delivery every day. Oh, you can do that. OK, that, that's, that yeah. will be better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah, my my older daughter wants to go there do a gap year. And uh, so I have to yeah. find something for her to do. But but she's not oh, interested um, in science. She's interested in art, museum. She yeah. wants to be a curator yeah. in the museum. Okay, yeah, I go to museums every week in, in Shanghai. So there's lots of them. Shanghai's museum is amazing. It's like, um, yeah. as good yeah. as New York. Um, I wouldn't go that far, but it, it, it's, it's good. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Okay. So, um, yeah, let's catch up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Right. Bye. I, I'll just finish typing this.